Thank you, my Jewish learning, for this great opportunity. So nice to be with you all. Some of you I recognize from the last couple of classes, some of you I see and know. Um, welcome to the month of Ma Cheshvan. Uh, yeah, please let's share the, the handout and uh, so everyone can begin to open it. Um, and I'll say while we're, while we're doing that, that the name of this month is in itself a clue to some of what we're going to be talking about. Sometimes it's called Cheshvan, and sometimes it's called Ma Cheshvan. And the, the Ma can seem added on because it's not there all the time. But actually, turns out, I was surprised when I discovered this, that the Ma is actually there in our earliest sources talking about the month, uh, like the Mishnah, for example, the first layer of rabbinic code. And it's actually more common to find rabbinic sources calling the month Ma Cheshvan, the full name, with the add-on, than it is to find them, them calling it just Cheshvan. So the, the mar is actually uh, pretty essential. And if you open the sheet, which hopefully you'll see the link in the chat there, Julie DeShares, thanks, Julie. You'll see the beginning of the sheet is uh, a few different things that the word mar might mean. And we don't know which of these are the original meaning for sure, but we, we have a, a theory that modern academics think, which is, is the first one, which is the number eight. Because the Torah says we should count our months from the month of Nisan, the month of spring, the month of Pesach. And this is the eighth month of, from counting from then. So that's what academics think is, uh, the, is what the Ma meant, that it's the eighth month. And that that's in uh, ancient Akkadian, which was the language that, that was used um, to write things down by the ruling class in ancient Babylon. So maybe it means that. We think so, maybe, but here are some other things it might mean, all of which are connected to what happened in the month and what we're going to learn about, which is what the spiritual work of the month is, like what we can do this month to grow. So it might also mean under the eight, you'll see there bitter, but ma still means bitter in modern Hebrew. And what, one reason people think this is because as opposed to the month we just had, which you may have noticed at a lot of festivals, Tishrei, now we're in a month with no festivals and actually not only no festivals, but not even any minor festivals, not even any fast days. And sadly, throughout Jewish history, a number of tragedies befell our people in this month. So possibly bitter, Mar Cheshvan. Uh, another meaning is it could mean a drop of water. And this month has many associations with water and we'll touch on some of those. And finally, it might mean, as also still is used in modern Hebrew, the word master. Um, and this could be like a, an assignation of um, uh, a, a title of respect, of honor. Uh, and that, that might be, because some of our sources say, because the first temple was completed in this month. And tradition holds that the third temple of the Messianic era of peace and justice for everyone will be dedicated in this month. So quite a, a quite a range of different associations of, of what's going to happen in this month especially given that a lot of people think oh you know it's just like an empty month you know like tishrei lots of things to learn about lots of interesting festivals and practices a lot of people think that um you know Cheshvan is you know a bit of a non-story but actually there's a lot going on here now somebody just messaged on the chat saying what about sig the Ethiopian holiday, which is celebrated very widely, especially here in Israel now. Absolutely right. And actually, I want to really uh, honor that and say these days, SIGS has really uh, changed the dynamic of, of Mark Heshran, but also want to know really, and you know, until the Ethiopian community were reunited with the rest of the Jewish people, you know, only in the last 30 or 40 years, um, you know, that wasn't something that uh, most people had come across. Thanks, Julie, for putting that on the chat so people can find out about that in their own time if you'd like to look, look into it more. Very interesting festival. Um, so one, one more uh, thing by word of introduction here. I mentioned in this intro note that because there's no festivals, one thing this month does, which really complements where we are in the calendar and what came before, is it invites us to appreciate what is our routine and to work on what is the routine we want. You know, we just had a month where there was no routine at all. And of course I'm talking about kind of in regular years where festivals are, you know, practice regularly, but this may be even more the case for you this year, or maybe less so in some ways because everyone's practices are changing so much because of what's going on. But generally our calendar, you know, deliberately disrupts everything in Tishrei with all the festivals. And then in Heshran, it's like, 
that down to routine. So how do we do what happens in our lives when it's just the six days of the, you know, the Hebrew work day, the work week, and then Shabbat, how, how does that go for us? What's our Shabbat practice like? How does it connect with the rest of the week? And so, and so on. Uh, and in agricultural terms, you know, in Tishrei, we celebrate the harvest, the Kot is a harvest festival, the in-gathering festival. And now it's time to dig deep and plant the seeds for what we hope is going to sustain us in the coming year. So also in every area of our lives, in our relationships, in our work, in everything that we're working on within ourselves and outside, this is a, this is a time for thinking about how, what do I want to dig down deep and plant? So that, that's also part of the intention I want to set as we're looking into everything that's happening this month. Um, just seeing uh, someone tell in the chat that, the, that Becca beautifully said that she's, she's resonating with that. That's great. I, I want to say to Becca and to everyone, you know, when I first started paying attention to the Jewish calendar, uh, from that moment onwards, I really noticed that it, it manifested on so many levels in my life. You know, what's going on inside, what's going on in my work, what's going on in my relationships. So I really want to invite everyone to think about all the different levels. Now, as uh, Julie mentioned, I live in Israel now. And when, when I moved to Israel, uh, the government provides something called Ulpan, which is Hebrew classes to help learn language. And I, had, I was very, very lucky. Ulpan can be a great experience, can also be something else. I was very lucky. I really had an amazing teacher, Oznat. And Oznat taught us this song. She played it for us and we learned the words as part of my Ulpan experience, and which which began just after the, the festivals, began at this time of year, a few years ago. And I resonated with it so profoundly. It's this song at the bottom of page one of the source sheet, A Different Renewal, Hit Chadshut Acheret, was first written by Nomi Shemer, who is really like the most, the most famous, um, really like the songwriter laureate of Israel in a lot of ways. She wrote Jerusalem of Gold and many other beautiful, famous songs in Israel. And... Um, Th these beautiful lyrics for me really say something profound about where we are in the calendar and the work we're going to do now. And this, this is like a modern classic in Israel. E everyone like uh, quotes these words all the time. After the festivals, acharei hachagim. So you should know in Israel, that's a catchphrase. Like it's not just, it's a catchphrase in a few different ways. First of all, it's a catchphrase in the sense of like, when people are busy getting ready for the festivals and during the festivals, you don't have time to do anything else. So it's like, let's talk about it after the Chagim. You know, I'll get around to it after the Chagim. But there's also a sense of like, after the Chagim, as she says here, everything will be renewed. Like everything is different. We go through that New Year, that Yom Kippur, that Sukkot, all these different experiences, and they change us. So after the festivals, everything will be renewed. The weekdays will be renewed and return. The air, the earth, the rain and the fire also you, also you will be renewed. Your work will not be completed. Your love will not be completed. So I, I love the way that the song really invites a sense of not, nothing is finished. You know, we just celebrated the end of one year and the beginning of a new one. And we're just beginning to plant new seeds again. We're just beginning to, to go into everything again. And everything is new and everything is just beginning. So that, that's uh, the invitation of Heshman. Just want to pause there and see if anyone has any... Uh, thoughts or, or feedback on anything we've covered so far. Just give anyone space to chip in if you'd like to. Great. I'm not seeing any hands. Feel free to say anything you want on the chat. Also, at any point, I will see that. And also, I'll stop every now and then and just like ask some questions and invite some more conversation. For now, let's see a little bit more of what's on the sheet. Um, so I mentioned some tragedies befell our people during this month. Sorry to, you know, have to go into the bad news a little bit. We, I feel it's, you know, important to be honest about how, how the tradition framed this month. So I, I mentioned here in the notes at the top of page two, two of our matriarchs, uh, Sarah and Rachel, Sarah and Rachel, passed, passed away in this month, according to uh, Midrash, which I've given you the references there. So the loss of a great figure, loss of a matriarch, you know, suggests a break in a chain it suggests, you know, the pain and the grief and the loss of vision, the loss of love. Um, and we also see later on in Jewish history, what happens in this source uh, and this source from the book of Kings, which I brought here. So this is a, actually a break in the kingdom. Uh, there used to be just one Israelite kingdom uh, under King David. 
and then under his son, King Solomon. And then after King Solomon, as we're going to read here, the ancient Israelite kingdom actually splits in two. And that happened during this month, very painfully. So here's the text. Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of his father, David. And his son, Rehoboam, succeeded him as a king, as king. Israel revolted against the house of David until this day. When all Israel heard that Jeroboam had returned, they sent messages, messengers and summoned him to the assembly and made him king over all Israel. Only the tribe of Judah remained loyal to the house of David. Jeroboam said to himself, now the kingdom may well return to the house of David. If these people still go up to offer sacrifices at the house of the Eternal in Jerusalem, the heart of these people will turn back to their master, King Rehoboam of Judah. They will kill me and go back to King Rehoboam of Judah. So the king took counsel and made two golden calves. He said to the people, you have been going up to Jerusalem long enough. This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. He set one up in Bethel, placed the other in Dan. And Jeroboam established a festival on the 15th day of the eighth month in imitation of the festival in Judah. So on the 15th day of Tishrei of Sukkot, oh, oh sorry, <laughs> 15th day of Tishrei is Sukkot. That's when the, the festival in Judah is happening. And a month later, on the 15th day of Malcheshvan, Jeroboam thinks it's a good idea to cement his rule to, to have an alternative festival and, and to say, just like the people said when they made the first golden calf, these are your gods of Israel who brought you off from Egypt, to, to say to these two golden calves about these golden calves, these are your gods of Israel. And essentially, he, he splits the kingdom in half and he coerces the people in his half of the kingdom to be a part of his new cult. Instead of going down to the temple in Jerusalem to be united with everyone else, he forces them to be part of his new idolatrous cult. And this happened on the new moon in the middle of Cheshvan. So pretty grim story and you know one with uh pretty pretty uh bad repercussions unfortunately you know the uh the kingdoms were split and eventually um the northern kingdom uh, disappeared it went off into exile even before the southern kingdom of judah did too and those those tribes were essentially lost like we we don't really know what happened to the people from those northern kingdoms there are all kinds of theories about you know people who who may come still to this day, who may be descended from those tribes, but we don't really know. They were essentially lost to the Jewish people. And that's why we are called Jews, uh, named after Judah, named after the southern kingdom of Judah and the tribe of Judah, because th those other 10 tribes were essentially lost. Just pausing there, see if anyone has anything you'd like to ask or say. Okay, good. So not, not the happiest story, but now we're going to see a little bit of um, the consolation uh, in in this story too, from Yalkut Shimoni, uh, gathering a midrash, and it says something says something really interesting here about our month Malcheshvan, and especially like in the position it's in, in the calendar between Tishrei and looking forward to the next month of Kislev, which you may or may not know is the month of Hanukkah. I just remembered it's better if I share my screen, so I'm going to do that. So. Here we go, top of page three. So Yaakut Shimoni, Rabbi Hanina said, on the 25th of Kislev, the work of the tabernacle was completed, but it was left folded up until Nisan. Now, because of this, the month of Nisan, excuse me, but now because of this, the month of, sorry, the month of Kislev, in which the work of the tabernacle was completed, lost out. The Holy One said, it is incumbent upon me to make restitution. What restitution did the Holy One make? The rededication of the temple by the Hasmoneans. And so too, the Holy One will compensate Malcheshvan in the future. It's actually a really important source. I want to unpack it a little bit. So it takes us all the way back to the 40 years that the Israelites were wandering in the desert, right? Between leaving Egypt and going to the promised land. And soon after getting the Torah, they are told to build the tabernacle, the Mishkan, essentially a portable temple that was the first temple. Before there was like a fixed temple, there was this portable temple in the desert. And tells us here that that was completed on the 25th of Kislev, which just happens to be the first day of Hanukkah. But nobody used the Mishkan. It wasn't, it wasn't even uh, unfolded. It was actually kept hidden, folded up for all that time from the middle of winter, Hanukkah time, all the way until the spring. 
So it's actually a nice, uh, also a nice kind of um, teaching about the seasons that, you know, during winter, a lot of things are, are folded up and hidden inside. And then in the spring, they, they, uh, they unfold and then they come to life. So that, that's, you know, happening on, on multiple levels there. Now, because of this, the months of Kislev, in which the, the Mishka and the Tabernacle was completed, lost out. Because, you know, after all, if it was finished then, one might have expected it to be used. Therefore, God makes it up to the month of Kislev. And this is uh, it's not unique. We have a lot of sources that talk about days and weeks and months as having personalities. So the month of Kislev it, it feel, it feels it's lost out, and God wants to make it up to the month of Kislev. How does God do it? He makes the miracle of Hanukkah and the rededication of the temple by the Maccabees, the Hasmoneans, happen in that month, in the month of Kislev. And in fact, not only in that month, but even on the very same day that the Mishkan was completed originally. So all, all the way back to just after you know, we got the Torah and left Egypt, so all the way forward, all the way to the miracle of Hanukkah, the Midrash is connecting these special things that happened on the 25th of Kislev. Now, here we are, uh, in, in Marcheshvan, on the last line of the Midrash, it says, so too the Holy One will compensate Marcheshvan in the future. And that, that's what we, uh, we saw mentioned before, that the future Messianic temple, our tradition says, will bring universal peace and justice to the whole world. That is, is meant to be uh, dedicated in our month of Marcheshvan, which essentially I, the Midrash is saying um, is is lacking, right? is, uh, is, uh, if, if the month of Kislev is aggrieved, then the month of Cheshvan just seems to be empty, just, just seems to be you know, devoid of any merit. So our month of Amar Cheshvan, that Mar, which might be interpreted as bitter, we said, might also be reinterpreted as Mar, as a, a designation of honor in the future. So that's the good news that, you know, we just read the story of the splitting of the kingdom, this tragedy that happened in, in that month in our month, uh, and you know, now we're seeing the tradition say, okay, there, there's, uh, there's, there's like challenges in this month, but there's also amazing potential, there's also amazing hope for, for what might happen. And now actually we're going to see a great Hasidic text from our Sadaq Cohen, who's going to tie the two together for us. And the next source from pre Sadiq on Maheshvan, he says, the saintly Rabbi Mendel of Rimanov taught that many tragedies befell our people in Maheshvan because this is when the kingdom of the house of David was divided. And it appears that this was not only for the sake of punishment, but rather that this would be the appropriate time to repair this division. This is a very common principle in Judaism and also in other traditions that you know, if there's a problem, it doesn't only mean there's a problem. It also means there's an opportunity for growth and learning. And that, that's what this teaching is. So yes, the kingdom was split in this month. But on the other hand, whatever it was that caused the kingdom to split is also inviting us to look more closely at it and potentially to heal it. And that also can happen in this month too. So that, that's uh, the invitation there from Rav Sado. I'd just like to uh, come back to all of you and just see if anyone has any uh, comments on that, any questions about that, or if anyone has examples from your own life where you you uh, you feel resonate with those with those examples from the tradition. Just seeing a few things on the chat I didn't see before. What claim did Jeroboam have to the throne? Was he son of David or even the tribe of Judah? Um, <laughs> very good question, and it would take us. A little bit uh, of subject. It's a little bit complicated. I'm happy to email about it after. Please, um, my email and website and everything is on the sheet. And please feel free just to remind me, and, I, and I'll uh, I'll follow up with you by email. Um, what you said before. It sounds like this month begins our doing of what we thought about promise doing the previous month. Promise about you know myself. Beautiful. So I really like that from Karen. You know, I talked a little bit about the digging and the planting seeds. So. One way to think about it is that during the festivals, we set intentions. We said, this is who I'd like to be for the coming year. And now it's time to actually do it. Yeah, that's, that's a beautiful way of putting it. Uh, Stuart says, I have thought of Hesran as the beginning of winter break. Is most, with, with most Jewish calendar events, happy and sad, running in two stretches, with each event leading to the next. The first from Shabbat Shekalem to Shavuot. And the second, after a short break, going from Tammuz to Simchat Torah. Cheshvan and Kislev, with the exception of Hanukkah and Deme, is our vacation 
from the cycle. So that's very interesting, Stuart. It certainly can seem like downtime, but actually what, what I actually like to, uh, you know, hopefully explore with you is that it's more that there's actually a lot happening. It's just a little bit more subtle and under the surface. That's right. In our calendar, there isn't actually such a thing in my experience as like a week off, a month off, a day off. It's really the case I found that all the time is connected. It's just that the energy sometimes is more uh, explicit. It's more like obvious what's happening on the outside. And sometimes it's more a question of like what's going on in, in more subtle ways inside. So, so that, that's my take on, uh, on what you wrote there. Uh, Carol, uh, Carolyn says, this now reminds me of the division in our country. Now we're so ill. Now we, now we are at the time for opportunity and growth. Please God, you know, but Hashem, it's a very beautiful intention, Carolyn. I, I hope so much that, you know, the, there are very sad divisions also here in my country, Israel, and, you know, also in many countries in the world. I hope so much that the divisions between people can be a source of learning and growth. Um, it's, a, it's a very wonderful intention. Um, even in the darkness, there was always hope in the offing. Beautiful from Raymond. So, you know, that's, that's what the, uh, the Hasidic masters were coming to say, right? That's what Rav Sadok there is saying. Don't worry that there's this apparent break and this problem and even this tragedy, as he said, and many tragedies, because it's all in the context of an opportunity for, for growth and hope. Beautiful. Melody says, this is a time of new opportunities for and to build momentum for new experiences. I also see it as a time of transformation. Beautiful. I, I really couldn't agree more. You know, and I, I'll add to that that Really, any moment is a time of transformation, potentially. It's the question of us knowing um, how to ride the wave that is coming in the moment. Like, wh what kind of transformation is available in this moment? Now, Rev Zalman from the Jewish Renewal Movement, Rev Zalman Shekhtar Shlomi, he talked talk about, you know, knowing which world was the appropriate one to be working in at the time. You know, was it the work, like, are, are you thirsty or hungry or needing to grow in the world of emotion or maybe the world of the intellect or maybe the world of your spirit? You know, sometimes he said people mistake uh, one kind of thirst or hunger for another one. So yeah, I very much agree with that it's a time of transformation. It's a question of how do we tune in to what's the transformation that's available to us. Uh, the divisions in the Jewish kingdom mirror the division in Bereshit, creation between the heavens and the earth, not a key top day. Beautiful from Aura. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, our national elections occur in Cheshvan. Will this divide or repair us? Richard, that's a very powerful question. Uh, Cheryl says, a time to internalize and integrate the powerful experiences from Av through Tishrei at Hanukkah rededication. Right. There, I just really want to um, underline, actually, what Cheryl just said, and especially in the context of that beautiful Midrash we just saw about the Mishkan. Cheshvan is very important in its own right, as I hope we're going to keep exploring together. You know, it's not, it's not just uh, an empty month, but it is, I think it is also really important to say the next major event in the calendar is Hanukkah. Even though Hanukkah wasn't mentioned in the Torah, it's a post-biblical festival, it's still very major as far as our spiritual masters are concerned in terms of its spiritual impact on us. And Hanukkah, so, and Cheshvan, sorry, this is a tough month for anyone who can't say ha, right? Tough, tough for our non-Jewish friends who just didn't, never got that right, or those of us who just never learned it. Right? My, I have a three-year-old who, who like, is learning uh, you know, with Israelis to speak. So he says ha all the time, even when there's no ha in the sentence. He's just like ha, ha, ha. He's just like obsessed with the sound. So practice your ha. On this month of Cheshvan, we are, we are definitely spiritually looking forward to Hanukkah, right? It, we're def that's definitely, you know, where we're headed. So yeah, I very much appreciate Cheryl kind of um, pointing us in that direction. Jenny says we can become even stronger, both within ourselves and externally in the world. Beautiful. So that, that's, that's the opportunity, hopefully, right? Wonderful. Really, really great stuff, everyone. Okay, so I'm very glad we checked in and everyone got to share who wanted to and please keep it coming and, and uh, you know hopefully we'll keep learning from each other that's great i'm gonna go back to the sheet and we're gonna see a little bit more of what's there so those of, those of you who did this class with me already previous months know i'd like to bring a passage from Sefi Yitzira about each month this is our oldest source of jewish mysticism it's i call it proto kabbalah because it's even before what academics say is Kabbalah, so, but it's, it's in, the, in the canon, it's kind of what led to Kabbalah. And it tells us a little something with a few, few clues about every month. 
this is what it tells us about our month of Malcheshvan. It says, he, that's God, made the letter Nun king over smell, and he bound a crown to it, and he combined one with another, and with them he formed Scorpio in the universe, Cheshvan in the year, and the intestine in the soul, male and female. So every month gets a letter, a constellation or a star sign, you know, an astrological sign, and a part of the body. And we, we, and also a faculty, something that people do. So sleep, anger, eating, hearing, seeing, we get smell, the sense of smell. So our month is the letter Nun, it's a sense of smell, and, it, and it's the astrological sign of Scorpio, and it's the intestine uh, in the body. So we are just going to see beautiful teaching now about the letter Nun and uh, how it relates to our month. So first of all, we're looking at a little passage over the page, top of the next page from the Talmud, from the tractate Brachot, which is mostly about prayer. And it's about a prayer that is uh, inserted into our morning and afternoon traditional liturgy uh, called Ashrei, Psalm 145. So Rabbi Yochanan says, why is there no verse beginning with the letter Nun in Ashrei? And just to fill out his question, Ashrei is an acrostic. It has one line for every letter of the alphabet, beginning with the first, ending with the last, and it only skips one letter, and that's Nun, the letter of our month. Wouldn't you know it? So how come, says Rabbi Yochanan, no Nun, all the other letters are there? Because it contains an allusion to the downfall of the enemies of Israel, which as I wrote there in the square brackets actually means the downfall of Israel. This is one of the, uh, the euphemisms the rabbis use. Sometimes they don't want to say something like bad because it's like a bad omen. They don't want to invite the evil eye. So they don't want to say the downfall of Israel, right? So instead they say the downfall of the enemies of Israel. Okay. So the letter Nun is not in our prayer because it contains the letter Nun itself. The letter contains an allusion to something bad happening to us. As it is written, the virgin of Israel has fallen and she will rise no more. So the word fallen in Hebrew begins with a Nun, Nafla. And actually, you know, that's, that's the common root for the word, uh, you know, fallen still to this day. So we use it all the time when we want to say that. So the letter Nun has that association. So therefore, we don't put it in that particular prayer. It's still a bit of a surprising teaching because, you know, you could probably find some good words to begin with in Nun too. You know, it doesn't have to mean that, but okay, that's what he says. Now, Rabbi Nachman by Yitzchak adds, even so, David went and provided support through divine inspiration, as it says, the Lord supports the fallen. So what's this support? It's actually the next line of Ashrei. After where the Nun would go, the next letter in the alphabet after Nun is Samach. So you, we don't have a line for Nun, but then the line that's right there after where it would be is Somech Hashem Lachon Hanoflim, that God supports all those who have fallen. And the Noflim there is that word that Rabbi Yochanan quoted before, that the, the, the same word, the same root, just in the plural form. So we don't have a Nun, because we don't want to talk about how we've fallen, but we do have the very next line saying, God supports the fallen. So let's see what Rabbi uh, or Sadok says about this in the next verse in the pre-Sadok. He says, every month has a specific matter to engage on, to engage work on, and in Mark Heshvan, it is to strengthen ourselves to begin to get up from having fallen and to bring ourselves into sanctity in awe of God. So what's going on here? So one way we can understand this is if we were privileged to have a meaningful experience of the festivals of Tishrei, hopefully all of them, but maybe just moments here and there, some of them. And again, you know, maybe this year that was more challenging for most of us. So you know, it wasn't a given, but at least hopefully on a regular year, the festivals offer us an opportunity for some connection, some inspiration. It can feel like an anticlimax to go from that to a month where there's nothing breaking the routine. Like, I'm sure I'm not alone and sometimes feeling that it's nice when things break up the routine, right? It gives us pleasure. It gives us a dopamine hit. It gives us excitement. It gives us a chance to connect with people we might not connect with usually. It gives us a chance to open to new ideas. It's exciting. And Rav Sadok here is addressing that feeling that it can feel like a fool to go from Tishrei to Cheshvan. It can feel like a fool. 
And actually he's saying the work here is to pick ourselves up and support ourselves in that context. And as a lot of you said in your beautiful comments on the chat, that's actually very meaningful work, which in itself is not even just, um, you know, an act of fixing something that was broken. It's also really an act of going forward in our lives because re really addressing those parts of ourselves, which feel like they're fallen, which feel like they're, they're missing something sometimes it is very much the work of going forward in our lives. You know, it's, it's learning how to parent ourselves. It's learning how to hold ourselves with care. It's learning how to recognize our own needs and give them to ourselves in a mature way. And, and that's what we need to plant those new seeds and go forward with that new vision. So that's the teaching about the noon. That's the, uh, the letter of the month. Now I want to do a little bit of work with you on the sense of smell, which Safi Asiro said was the, uh, the sense of the month. Just going to uh, check back in with you quickly on the chat. Oh, wait, I have to stop sharing my screen to do that. Okay, hello. Right, let's just see if there's anything new here from any of you. Uh, no, we're good. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go back to sharing. Okay, great. So section two is scent and consciousness. And the sense of smell that Safi Yatsura mentioned is according to scientific consensus, the most powerful sense that we have. So two reasons here, I run them on the sheet, you see them, the text in italics here. It is a sense that involves the most direct contact with the object we're sensing. When we smell something, we're actually inhaling molecules from the object itself into our nose. Before I knew that, when I found that out, I was just blown away by that. We're actually having direct contact with the object when we smell something. Two, the part of our brain that processes our experience of smell is the primitive and highly influential limbic system, which plays a major role in shaping our emotions, moods, memories, and behavior. In other words, we don't smell something with our prefrontal cortex, which is, which is concerned with um, values and ideas and who we'd like to be. We smell something with the primal part of us, which is really our survival mechanism. It's where, the limbic system is where we have our fight or flight or freeze mechanism, for example. So when we smell something, it goes very, very deep to the core of who we are. And we actually, and not, not just the smell of it, but we're actually having a direct experience of the object itself when that happens. So let's see what the Talmud says about the sense of smell. Rabbi Zutra Bartuvia said, uh, Rav said, from where is it derived that one recites a blessing over scent? As it is stated, let every soul praise the eternal. From, from sorry, what is it from which the soul derives benefit and the body must not derive benefit from it. You must say, this is scent, this is smell. So let every soul praise the eternal, says the psalm. And, and the rabbis say, why would the soul praise God? Why not, why not praise God with your body and your whole being? And, and the answer is, there's something that the soul experiences and benefits from that the body doesn't. There's something, there's something that the body goes through that the body, sorry, something the soul goes through that the body doesn't go through, and that is smell. So this is one of the ways the rabbis are trying to say in their ancient language that smell goes right to the core of who we are. It goes straight to the soul, right? It's not something that we experience with our, our persona, our outer self, you know, the part of ourselves we show to the world, or even our body. It's part, it's part of our self that is very, very, hidden and and within that experiences this powerful sensory sensation now we're going to see something else about sense of smell from the book of isaiah and then what the talmud says about it over the next page isaiah 11 1 to 4 but a shoot shall grow out of the stump of jesse jesse is the father of david a twig shall sprout from his stock the spirit of the eternal shall alight upon him a spirit of wisdom and insight <clears throat> a spirit of counsel and valor, a spirit of intimacy with and awe for the eternal. He will sense the truth by his awe for the eternal, and he will not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by what his ears perceive. And he will judge the poor with righteousness and decide with justice for the lowly of the land. He shall strike down a land with the rod of his mouth and slay the, lick, slay the wicked with the breath of his lips." So it's talking about the Messiah. The Messiah comes from the line of David, hence the stump of Jesse. And God's going to give this person wisdom and all these wonderful things. And he will sense the truth 
and he will not judge by the sight of his eyes. So how's he going to work? Here's what the Talmud says. Rabbi says that he will sense how Richo teaches that the Messiah will smell the Morach and then judge on that basis, as it is written, and he will not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by what his ears perceive. And he will judge the poor with righteousness and decide with justice for the lowly of the land. So the verses did say that he wouldn't use his eyes by all his ears, but didn't say explicitly that he would smell. But the, the Talmud is slightly reinterpreting one of the words here, the word for sense, right? the Harichor, and saying, really, we can reread that. It's, from, it's almost the same as the word for smelling, the Morach. And so maybe they're saying, the way that the Messiah is going to be able to bring peace and justice to the world and is going to be able to judge righteousness is that he's going to have this very inner sense. He's going to have this sense of smell, that as, we, as we were saying, for the rabbis, goes straight to the soul. It has something to do, you might say, with our innermost intuition. We see a beautiful Hasidic teaching now from Lekute Halakot from Reb Noson of Breslov. Now, Reb Noson was the main student of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, famous Hasidic master. And here's what he says about the connections between sense of smell and some of the other themes that we've seen brought up in this month. Remember that we saw this month is going to be the month when the third temple, the Messianic temple, will be dedicated also. So he says the Messiah, the, the, the future savior, hopefully, will open everyone's eyes to intimately know that the transcendent divine is the imminent divine. So in our, in our tradition, that's Hashem, the, the four-letter name of God, is Elohim. And we say at the end of the liturgy on uh, Yom Kippur, for example, Hashem Hu Elohim, Hashem Hu Elohim. So the transcendent is the imminent. God up there, who we know nothing about whatsoever, is also the divine that we experience down here in the world. It's the same thing. It's all one. As it is written, for the land shall be filled with intimate knowledge of the eternal as water covers the sea. That's from the same section of Isaiah as we just quoted from. It's just a few verses on from what we just quoted from up there. Therefore, he goes on, Reb Nossin goes on, the Messiah, the Mashiach in Hebrew, Mashiach is named after the anointing oil, Shemen HaMishchach. Now, this is fascinating. Mashiach does indeed mean, the, the Messiah actually does mean the anointed one. What happened was, you know, the word um, originally meant the, anoint, the anointed one, right? Mashiach, it first appeared in Hebrew, and then it got translated through Greek and through Latin and so on. And we've ended up with this English word, Messiah, that's like an anglicized version of what started off as the Hebrew word. So we go around saying Messiah, Messiah, Messiah. But what it actually means is the anointed one, right? The Mashiach is actually the, the core of what it means to be the Mashiach is somebody connected to the oil of anointing. For, the, for through the sense of smell, which is an aspect of the anointing oil, the life force of the soul is awakened. For the sense of smell is an aspect of the surrender of our ego self. This is a classic Hasidic rereading and, and uh, association of all these different subjects to, with the aim of, of really creating a lesson for us. Those of us who are not personally maybe, um, you know, I don't happen to be the Messiah as far as I know, but nonetheless there's a lesson here for me in all these symbols, in all, the, in all these associations. So what is it? Let's unpack it together. The Mashiach, the Messiah, is named after the, that oil of anointing, and which is strongly connected to the sense of smell. As we've seen this month, uh, our ancient mystical tradition, Sefi Yasira says, pay attention to the sense of smell. And the rabbis say, sense of smell is something which goes very, very deep inside us, which, which uh, we, we experience with our innermost self. And he, he ties it together here today uh, in, in this source, in a, in a lesson for us which is there's something about um, the sense of smell that can, as he says, awaken the force of the soul. So let's see how, what, what that is in Hebrew. Uh, so the, uh, the life force of the soul can be drawn and harshimu shall bittle. That can uh, give us an impression, give us an experience of surrender. So when I, when I learn this, I think of powerful incense 
giving people a powerful experience of changing their mind state and their, their state of mind being altered by that from a direction of being more egocentric to a place of being more expansive, to, be, to a place of being more connected to other people, having a sense of self that was less focused on my ego self and more connected to being part of all of life. Now, we can do that by smelling incense. And you know, I heartily encourage people who like incense to use incense. That's great. We can also just know that we can use our sense of smell to do that anytime throughout this month, especially, but also anytime. We can smell beautiful fruit, we can smell beautiful flowers, we can smell the world around us and know that we are connected to the world around us in such a powerful way through that sense. And we can use that to remember that we are part of the interconnected wearer of life. So that's the lesson there from Reb Nossam. That's, that's where I'd like to leave it for today. Our, our time is coming to an end. Um, and I'll come back now to all of you and just see if anyone has any questions or comments about any of that. Uh, the spices of Havdala revive and lift to face the coming week, bringing the sweet fragrance of Noe. Beautiful from Cheryl, yeah. That's a, that's a really important example of when we use smell at the end of Shabbat. Um, to, uh, as the, the Talmud says, we use smell at the end of Shabbat literally uh, to bring ourselves back to life uh, because we're sad at the departure of Shabbat. We're, the Talmud says that... Um, on Shabbat, we get an extra soul and a Shami Yatera and an extra life force and an extra lease of life. And so we lose that when Shabbat goes away. So to bring us back to life, the Talmud says, we revive ourselves with smelling those spices. So yeah, that's a, that's a really beautiful connection there. And also, especially in this month, as I mentioned before, there's no festivals. So we can really focus on our Shabbat practice and, and especially the relationship between Shabbat and the rest of the week, which Havdalah is an important part of, yeah. Um, if anyone's not familiar with Havdalah, it's a very beautiful seminar, ceremony, and I am sure that My Jewish Learning has a really good article on what it is, so feel free to check that out. Uh, they, they're pretty solid on those kind of things. Uh, the sense of smell was not involved in the fall. Yes, brilliant, from Raymond. I'm really glad you mentioned that. So this is a, a teaching of the mystics that in the Garden of Eden, I mean, it's also there in the, in the plain meaning of the Torah, but the mystics draw attention to it. In the Garden of Eden, when the, the tree of the forbidden fruit was eaten, nobody smelt it. And, that, and there's actually uh, an understanding in the mystics that if they would have used their sense of smell, maybe they would have made a better decision because smell is connected in this deep way to our inner intuition, as we've been seeing a little bit. That's great, Raymond. Ronnie says, the great story about a Jerusalem rabbi in 1920, British rule Jerusalem. The Kotel was filled with trash. In a nutshell, the British general asked him how he could live this way, so close to the rubbish. He said, to be first in line when the Mashiach will arrive. So the general asked him, has he arrived? So the rabbi put his nose out his window facing the Kotel, took in a large amount, responded to the general, not, yeah, that's brilliant. It was, uh, Ronnie, thank you so much. That's brilliant. Thank you. Uh, I, I really appreciate that. I'd actually, Love to, to know more about that story. Um, if you can email me about it, if you like, if you can, I would appreciate that. That'd be great. Uh, this is a little off topic, but also uh, smell of geography. Growing up in NYC, I also associated the smell of Sukkot with pine. Living in Florida, it was palm fronds. In other places, yeah, beautiful. You know, I, I actually, I want to honor that. You know, the smells of the season are a very important level of association. And, and, and as you know, we did mention before when we talk about, you know, how powerful the sense of smell is, it goes right inside us. And I think it's fair to say a lot of us have the experience that smell can bring back powerful memories and associations, I think often more viscerally than other senses for a lot of us. So uh, yeah, Steve, I think you're right on that. Uh, just curious and experience, how many do you think about what the smells were in the Bible and the seasons versus where in the world you might be? So, you know, the, uh, the Torah as it was originally practiced, you know, in the land of Israel, obviously has like specific plants and other smells going on. But, you know, as the Jewish people have traveled around the world, just like those examples you gave there, different things came to be associated with the seasons. Um, but yeah, it is, I must say, is part of the privilege of living here is kind of being in tune with like, you know, I literally live in the place where the willow plants grow, where the, it says in the Mishnah, like, this is where we take the willow from to, uh, to use in the temple on Sukkot and Hashanah Rabbah. 
and I live next to those willow plants. So it's, it's very like powerful and evocative, like being like, you know, they literally meant the same plants that I'm using today. So that, that is a beautiful thing. But wherever you are in the world, you have your own, uh, you know, associations with what's going on in the, se- in the seasons of this time. To see a little bit more from everyone, sense of smell more than any other sense, it was able to trigger memories, either good or bad. Right, like I said, thanks, Melody. Brilliant. It's good to know I'm right sometimes. It seems a bit like we are moving from deep introspection in our holidays to an openness to the world around us via our senses in the weeks to come after. Oh, I like that from Michael. Yeah, I really like that because, um, you know, actually, you want to compliment that by saying, you know, I said every month in Safety at Sira has a human faculty or sense or activity to, to work on, right? So the month of Tishrei that we just finished, the last month, month of the festivals, interestingly, the human activity to pay attention to is sex, right? Which is, which is you know, intimate, I, mean, we, I don't need to define sex, but you know what sex is, right? But like, you're right, this is a little bit more like in, engaging with what's going on around us, right? That's the point. Yeah, I think you make it very well, beautiful. Uh, Steve says, interesting that the coronavirus dulls the sense of smell. Steve, somebody said this to me and I want to say to all of you, please God, may all of our sense of smell be blessed this month, right? Maybe we'll be blessed with good health in every way, especially in this way. Beautiful. Uh, there's, there's a few more. I want to do, I want to honor these. Um, smell is such a primal sense. How a baby knows his mother, right? How animals find their way. How we say sometimes I smell something fishy of enjoyment. and something. Yeah, I really, yeah. That's very powerful, especially the baby thing. I really, I really, uh, really seen that very viscerally myself. That, that's really powerful and true. Wow! Thank you, everyone, for those wonderful comments and questions. That was great. Um, I think our time is done, so I just want to say thank you. I want to also say again, my website and my email are on the sheet. And if you'd like to be in touch, I'm very, very happy to hear from you. Um, and also, I teach online a lot, so you're welcome to to be in touch with me about that. And uh, thank you so much to Julie and My Jewish Learning. This is great.